Whatever you do, get rid of this fear of missing out, this terrible lust to participate in profit making that comes along at the end of every one of the great bubbles. It is incredibly seductive, very hard to resist. Being there, done that myself a few decades ago, made a fortune and wiped myself out. A very salutary, and I would wish on most of you that you avoid it. It's crossed off all the boxes, it's done all the things that a super bubble typically does, and it could uh, start its way down any time and perhaps a month ago. It needs a long bull market, and we had 11 years, so the longest in history. It needs a lot of crazy behavior, and we had some of the great crazy behavior of all time. I think they'll be telling these stories in 20 years. It needs to accelerate at the end of a bubble. That's something like three times the average rate of uh, the bull market, and it did that. From COVID on upwards, the NASDAQ more than doubled, and it, it went up at well over three times the normal rate. And finally, a thing that is unique to the super bubbles, the two or three that just keep going and going, is that at the end, the speculative stocks start to peel off. And even on the upside for the broad market, they start to go down. And that started early last year, the super duper specs, the worst of them all, started to decline. And then one by one, uh, they fell in and started to drop. And as we sit today, something like 40% of all the NASDAQ stocks are down over 50%, which is pretty amazing since it's only the other day the S&P was at its all-time high in late December. Nothing is certain in life, but I would say that is the beginning of the burst when the specs that typically go up quite a lot more than the market go down as the market goes up. So the S&P went up 25% last year, and a lot of the most speculative stocks of 2020 were already going down. That is very rare. It happened in 1929. It happened in 1972 before the very big decline then. It happened in 2000 before the tech wipeout. So you're saying we are at the beginning of a crash? I would say it is likely that we are. I think it would be unlikely that the market would not come down by 50% from its peak, the broad market, the S&P. And it would be unusual if the specs did not do worse than that. The problem is, is it slow or is it quick? The um, stimulus program left a lot of money in individual hands for buying the dip. And they have been throwing money this year, individuals, at the dips. They have probably never invested more uh, rapidly than they have this year. And despite that, of course, the market is down. But they have a lot of money. They're pretty well funded. Corporations, many corporations are doing well. The economy isn't too bad. So this could be turn out to be quite a struggle where slowly but surely the market has to readjust to higher and higher rates and higher inflation. It will not give up, I suspect, too easily, but we'll fight it out. If you look at the real estate market, all real estate markets pretty well around the world are uh, very, very high. And if you look at the bond market, of course, interest rates are incredibly low and bonds are incredibly high. But when it comes to the stock market, rather like 2000 and the tech bubble, this is more an American affair than anything else. Outside America, the world is merely overpriced, ho-hum. It's often overpriced. It's usually not that dangerous. In the US, however, we have an extreme overpricing, extreme crazy behavior. And I think we're in a rather dangerous equity bubble. So there is a decent chance that Australia, the UK, Japan, there's some fairly reasonably priced countries. If they come down in sympathy, they'll come down a lot less and probably rally earlier. This bubble in the US is eerily similar to the 2000 tech bubble. It's led by the NASDAQ, it's led by the SPECs. 2000, the SPECs underperformed all year and the S&P continued to climb. It is just possible that the S&P will rally to a new high. I think it is impossible that the specs will. So I think the game has started and uh, it will play out perhaps rather like a 2000. Historically, the stock market has hated inflation. It crushes price earnings ratios. This time, uniquely, 
It did not. Inflation started June of last year, roared through the roof, and the PEs continued to rise. Nothing like that had happened before. And we have a model that goes back to 1925. And there are two factors that determine price earnings ratios or the price level of the market. One of them is profit margins. Of course, it loves them. And the other is inflation. Of course, it hates it. And uh, they have worked like a charm. And in 2000, you had, for example, at the top of the market, world record profit margins and uh, very little inflation. And today we have world record profit margins, but we have rather high inflation. The market should have dropped starting in the middle of last year had it been following the normal battle plan. It did not. The market is saying about inflation that it totally ignores it. It completely believes the Fed that it's uh, temporary, ephemeral, etc. And uh, it doesn't appear to be. And if that seeps into the market in the usual way, it will mercilessly depress the price earnings ratios. And in the end, the Fed doesn't like to get on the bad side of the administration. Politically, inflation is death. The average person in the street notices it, measures it, if anything, exaggerates it. But even with that exaggeration, it's painful and politically very, very tough on the voting pattern. And therefore, the administration really wants to do everything it can to get inflation down. So it will be discreetly leaning on the Fed to do what it can. There are people who spend their entire lives watching the Fed and going into the nuances of quarter points and half points. And I do not. I am confident that they will move at the stronger end of the range. I am confident they will try very hard to make sure that inflation does not become embedded. I'm also confident that that will be difficult because we're very short of labor, we're running very scarce, and wage rates will start to come through the system in the US increasingly for the next few months. That makes it very difficult to control inflation. So it will be quite a struggle, and the Fed will have to raise the rates quite a bit. If you have to own US stocks, you should own high quality stocks that are in good financial shape because this can always spiral in to something of a financial crisis. They often do. I would emphasize in general though, non-US stocks and uh, quite a few countries, as I said, are not that bad. Emerging markets has some overhang problems. If the US goes and commodities are high priced, it's a mixed blessing at best for them, but they're very, very cheap. And in the end, cheapness usually trumps everything else. So emerging markets, some of the cheaper developed countries would be very much better idea than a massive holding of US equities. I think it is ending. I'm trying to write a paper, which is basically the end of the golden era or Goldilocks and three hungry bears. Um, everything has been different for the 20 years of the 21st century. The PEs average not just a little bit higher, but 56% higher. Profit margins average 30, 35% higher than they had in the previous 50, 60 years. Everything seemed to work out. Corporations got a lot of political power. The taxes on capital all dropped. Tax on dividends, tax on interest rates, tax on capital gains all came down. Most of the regulatory bodies were somewhat captured by corporations and uh, they've had a golden era. We've never seen bigger profits. The concentration in each industry has increased and the fangs that are remarkable companies are in their own way, instant monopolies. So the monopolistic feature of our economy today and somewhat around the world has increased. This is very good for profits. It's not so good for growth. And the governments are beginning to twitch a bit. I don't think they're uh, assets. I think they embed a technology that may turn out rather like the internet to be useful here, there and everywhere. And when they are useful and when they're making money in the traditional way, then you value it like any other money making enterprise. But while they just sit there and they go up in price uh, because people are persuaded that they will go up in price, it's very much a question of the emperor and his clothes, I think. Uh, Bitcoin in particular, it does nothing for anybody and is superseded by a whole generation of smarter and more effective cryptocurrencies, many of which in their turn do not make money in the traditional way and a few do. So I'm sure the idea 
embedded in cryptocurrency will be around perhaps forever. But I'm equally certain that most of the value today as a store of value is a hoax. It is not a store of value. Everyone can agree that the volatility is massive. It goes up and down with the high risk stocks. What is the point of a store of value that trades like a hyperspec? I mean, this is not the principle. Gold in comparison with several thousand years of practice has been uh, boringly stable throughout the last couple of years. Mm. I should know I own some. Uh, stay out of trouble. Make sure you don't buy expensive markets, expensive stocks. Emphasize value, cheapness for what you get. Hunt around for the cheaper countries. Hunt around for the cheaper stocks within those countries. Carry some cash reserves. There'll be perhaps some very nice buying opportunities. And um, whatever you do, get rid of this fear of missing out, this terrible lust to participate in profit making that comes along at the end of every one of the great bubbles. It is incredibly seductive, very hard to resist. And I would wish on most of you that you avoid it. Thank you. Bye bye.